Hey, Larry Mednick here. So this morning we are doing a little bit of uh, ground school on aerodynamics, basic aerodynamics of the trike. And I uh, figure we go ahead and video this so we can maybe share it uh, with the rest of our uh, Facebook and YouTube uh, friends. Anyway, uh, we're going to start with the real basics. And uh, the biggest thing you have to understand about any aircraft that's flying, whether it's a Revo or a F-16, is that uh, wind on the ground is simply the air moving relative to the earth. And so once we leave the earth with our aircraft, that wind no longer affects us the same way as it affects something that's on the ground. The um, relative wind is, we're gonna use this pen to show relative wind. So right now in here, there's no wind at all. There's no wind hitting my palm just because there's no fan blowing. But if I swing my hand around like this, I have relative wind hitting my hand. I'm creating that wind by moving through the atmosphere. So as soon as we leave the ground, our relative wind is going to be two things. It's going to be opposite of our flight path, and the speed of the relative wind is going to be the speed in which we're moving through the air. So when we're flying along at, let's say, 60 miles per hour, our relative wind is 60 miles per hour. If we have a 15 mile an hour wind that's going this direction on the ground, that means that we're gonna be going 60 miles an hour through the relative wind, minus 15 miles per hour of wind, and that's gonna give us a ground speed of 45 miles per hour across the ground. How fast are we traveling through the air? 60 miles per hour. Likewise, we turn around and we're still going 60 miles an hour through the relative wind, and our ground speed now is 75 miles per hour. But if we could take a wand and make the earth disappear, the ground has no bearing on us unless we're trying to get from A to B or reference the ground when we're flying. But as far as the actual aerodynamics and how the plane is flying, the actual wind has nothing to do with anything. The only wind we're concerned about is our relative wind. So. Now, we do not do aerobatics with a trike. Uh, your bank angle, maximum 60 degrees, which is pretty healthy. This is about 60 degrees right here. And 30 degrees nose up, 30 degrees nose down. So those are your parameters. But just for example's sake, we're going to show you that if the trike was in a dive coming straight down, the relative wind would be straight up. And if the trike was going straight up, the relative wind would be straight down. Now that we kind of understand what relative wind is, where it's coming from and how fast it's going, uh, the second thing we're going to talk about is angle of attack. And so angle of attack is the angle between the cord line of the wing and the relative wind. So right here, if we measured the angle between our relative wind and the cord line, you would get the angle of attack. So a lot of times uh, some trikes will do zoom climbs where they're climbing out very steeply and you'll hear people on the ground, they're gonna say, wow, that guy's climbing out of there, a really high angle of attack. That may not be true at all. He's climbing out at a very steep pitch attitude or very high nose up attitude, but his angle of attack may be low, it may be high. It really depends where the control bar is. Uh, if the bar is out, he's probably at a very high angle of attack, but you can climb very steeply with the bar in your belly, depending on what your airspeed is. So your angle of attack uh, is much more to do and everything to do with the relative wind to your wing, not the direction that the aircraft's going. You could be at a very high angle of attack coming down in a steep dive, and you can see in my example here, we've got the control bar all the way out. This aircraft could actually stall because it's at a high angle of attack where we've exceeded the critical angle of attack of the wing. So now that we understand angle of attack, um, we're gonna use this as our wing and to uh, explain how lift works on a wing. So if this little guy is our wing, we have angle of attack makes lift. No angle of attack doesn't necessarily make lift. Negative angle of attack, it makes, uh, well, it does make lift, but in the opposite direction. So what we're wanting to do with a wing is we're wanting to take that relative wind and we're wanting to deflect it down. And if you want some real good information on the subject, you need to pick up the book Stick and Rudder. Now it's all related to like a J3 Cub, I think, in the entire book. 
but it all applies to trikes and anything that flies with a basic wing and our trike certainly uh, qualifies as that. So we want to deflect this relative wind downwards and that's going to give us the equal and opposite uh, reaction, Newton's law. Uh, of course we were all taught with uh, 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 Bernoulli effect and how that works. Um, I want to actually kind of uh, avoid talking about that uh, and just talk about Newton's law and uh, how angle of attack and critical angle of attack increase and then drastically decrease the lift on a wing. So let's go over to our dirty old sink and I'm going to show you how I can make lift with uh, this uh, license. Now I want you to imagine that this water is the relative wind and that this license is the wing. And what I want to do is I want to deflect my relative wind. I want to scoop it downward so I can move all the water to the three inches. And then when I increase it too far, most of my water is going back and I've lost my lift entirely. And that's where the water is stalling on this airfoil, which of course isn't much of an airfoil. It cannot stick to the back side of the, uh, of the airfoil. And so that separation is the stall. And so that stall happens at critical angle of attack. Now the design of the wing and the shape of the wing, the entire structure is going to dictate whether that stalls at 18 degrees or 19 degrees or try to stall at a very high angle of attack. Okay, so some more basics regarding that lift. Our aircraft in this example, let's say weighs a thousand pounds. We're going 60 miles per hour. At 60 miles per hour, at this particular angle of attack, A, uh, we're making a thousand pounds of lift. And so we're in a stabilized flight. And so long as we make a thousand pounds of lift and we weigh a thousand pounds, the aircraft is going to just stay in the air and fly. Now, the moment that we reduce the angle of attack by pulling the control bar in, we're taking away angle of attack. Therefore, we no longer have whatever, let's say we're at 18 degrees angle of attack here, we reduce it to 15 degrees angle of attack. Now at 60 miles per hour, we're not making a thousand pounds of lift anymore. The aircraft is not going to stay up in the air. However, if we add some throttle, um, we can now increase our speed to let's say 70 miles per hour at the lower angle of attack. And now we're making a thousand pounds of lift again and the aircraft staying in the air. So we can interchange airspeed with angle of attack right up until a couple of things happen. The faster we go, like your car, the more parasitic drag that you have on the carriage. However, if you think about the wing, in order to go fast, we're going to reduce the angle of attack. So don't look at the carriage for a second, look at the wing. As we reduce the angle of attack with the wing, the drag on the wing, the induced drag, actually lowers. The drag on the yellow part, the carriage, actually increases. So you have a trade-off of when you're very slow, you have a very high induced drag, but you have a very low parasitic drag. And as you go faster, the induced drag goes to the inverse. And so there's a sweet spot right where my hands meet where you are at your best lift over drag. And that means that you're at the lowest overall drag based on the induced drag maybe not being quite so high and the parasitic drag not being quite so high. If you go any faster, you're going to increase the parasitic drag. If you go any slower, you're going to increase the induced drag. So your best L over D is your best rate of climb. It's your best glide ratio speed to use. Um, it's your, uh, you're going to go the furthest distance you can basically and it, you can add wind into the uh, factor we're not going to talk about that if you have a heavy headwind sometimes best L over D is not your most efficient from A to B you may want to go faster into the wind but uh, basically um, there's a sweet spot which is your best L over D and uh, that's important to understand so where does that come into play okay I'm climbing out there's a mountain in front of me and I want to clear that mountain well, uh, hopefully you've been through the manual in the aircraft and you know what your best VX is. Your best VX is your best angle of climb, VX. And that's going to get you in the shortest distance, the greatest height. 
Okay? So if you're trying to clear an obstacle, you want to understand that. The problem is, what people tend to do is because when you're flying at 60 miles per hour and you push the control bar forward, all of a sudden you get a release of energy. And that really tends to make the aircraft want to go up, but it's a very temporary uh, effect. And the faster you move the control bar forward, the more pronounced that nose up. So it feels good. It feels like, wow, if I just keep pushing forward, I'm gonna just keep climbing more and more and more. And that's not true. So anything where you get the control bar in front of your best angle climb speed uh, or your best VX and you go to a higher angle of attack, the induced drag now becomes so great that you rob horsepower and efficiency of flight and the aircraft stops climbing so well to the point where in some cases, very, very high altitudes, hot days, the aircraft can actually start coming back down again. You need to pick up airspeed in order to climb very, very counterintuitive. And so it's important that you understand that if you want to get up to a thousand feet in the shortest amount of time, that the control bar is not going to be way out forward. You're going to use now your best rate of climb. And in a minute's time, you're going to get to a thousand feet the quickest. If you're using best angle with more induced drag, you're going to get to a thousand feet shorter, but it's going to take you a minute and 10 seconds, a minute and 20 seconds to get to a thousand feet. Here, you're a thousand feet, but it only took a minute. The cool thing about airspeed when it comes to altitude is that your indicated airspeed right. is always going to work. I'll give you an example. Your stall speed at gross is 39 miles an hour. At sea level, you're going to indicate 39 miles an hour when it stalls if you're at gross weight and you're flying in straight and level flight. Mm -hmm. Now you go up to 10,000 feet, you're still gonna indicate 39 miles per hour when you stall, but you're gonna be going uh, quite a bit faster. I'd have to go to the charts, but it's well over 10% uh, higher. So you're gonna be well into your 40 mile per hour range at 10,000 feet, but you're still gonna indicate that 39 miles per hour. And that's important to really understand. When we talk about speed, uh, we're picking up our speed at the pitot tube, and the pitot tube is measuring pressure. As the atmospheric pressure gets lower, as the air thins out, well, it's not going to push that needle up to that 60 miles per hour until you're actually going 70. But whether you're flying high altitude or low altitude, you can use the indicated air speeds to say, okay, I should be climbing out at 60 miles per hour. That's my best rate of climb. At 10,000 feet, you're gonna be going like 70 miles an hour, but you still use 60 indicated. Mm -hmm. And at sea level, you're gonna be going more like 60 miles an hour, you use indicated. So that's the nice thing, is your indicated should work at all altitudes. So the neat thing about the trike, and I think it's really cool, is that the control bar is like a giant angle of attack indicator. And so when we push the control bar out to critical angle of attack, which is generally going to be when the control bar meets your front limit. Of course, some of our things like our revs don't have that, yeah, but true. in most cases, you're gonna stall when you get all the way out, and when you're not all the way out, you're not stalled. And that's something special because airplanes so often are gonna really be reading that airspeed indicator because when you're holding a stick, you don't really exactly know where to put the stick to hold a certain airspeed with your aircraft and you can get really good and, and some guys cannot look but any student with under 100 hours they better be using an airspeed indicator and a fixed wing to figure out what their angle of attack is and at the end of the day when we reference airspeed all we really want to know about is our angle of attack are we at high angle attack are we at a low angle of attack are we near critical angle of attack where we have a drastic loss in lift called stall where the aircraft is going to now nose over and uh, and hopefully recover if the pilot doesn't continue <laughs> to hold the control bar forward. You know the old <laughs> joke is you know how to get the uh, or the trike to go up. You uh, you push the control bar forward. You know how to get the trike to come down. You push the control bar all the way forward. <laughs> of course, that'll exceed the critical angle of attack, and the nose will drop. So let's just talk about the stall for a second. We now hopefully understand that when our relative wind exceeds the critical angle of attack of the wing, whatever that is, it's based on the design of the wing. Some will be higher, some will be lower. 
the wing is going to stall. In the trike, much like an airplane, the nose is going to drop, which is then going to reduce the angle of attack to the relative wind naturally. So if you release the controls after a stall in a trike, um, it's going to recover on its own. So the question I have for you is, do you know why the nose drops when you stall with a delta wing? And it's a different reason than why an airplane drops its nose when it stalls. So you can't see it in this model because the people that built this model apparently don't understand the actual aerodynamics of a trike. But what should be present on this wing, and we can look at it on the real thing here in just a moment, is twist. So the wing is going to be, let's just say at 18 degrees angle of attack here at the moment to the relative wind. That 18 degrees, as the wing twists, it reduces angle of attack. It's also called washout. And at the very tips, in many cases, most cases, you're gonna be flying at a negative angle of attack at the tips, which means they're not producing any lift at all. In fact, they're gonna be producing downforce. Um, so what happens is, as you exceed the critical angle of attack here, you haven't exceeded the critical angle of attack here, and you certainly haven't exceeded the critical angle of attack in the wingtips. Because the wingtips are aft of the hang point, which is your CG on the wing, they're still flying. So when the center section of the wing stalls and gives up, up lift, and the wingtips are still flying, the aircraft noses over, that nose over reduces angle of attack, restores lift to the center of the wing, everything starts flying again unless the person pushes the bar forward again and can restall it. And uh, most trikes, you can hold it in a stall if you don't release the control bar forward it, uh, it will stay in a stall. Another thing that can happen, and, and uh, again, because of the twist, it's less likely uh, that trikes will do this. Uh, usually it's more airplanes that tend to, but you can drop a wing. And so what'll happen is usually has to do with doing a stall, but with one wing lower. And usually it will break the direction that the aircraft's leaning. So if you can get your wings perfectly straight and you lean forward, and you got your compression strut perfectly straight when you stall, you can stall, and uh, we did it yesterday on your third lesson, you were able to actually hold that, that uh, from dropping a wing pretty good. Mm -hmm. But if you're reaching for the controls, if your aircraft is off at an angle when you stall, a lot of times you're gonna have a tip stall. And understanding this is really, really important. Uh, when one wing stalls and you get a rotation uh, effect. What do you think happens to the wing that's going up? What happens to the relative wind as this wing starts to rise? That's going to decrease, because now your relative wind is coming from here, it's mm -hmm. going to decrease the angle of attack on the wing that's going up, and it's going to increase on the wing that's going down. And so therefore what happens is the stalled section of the wing that was equal, as it starts to rotate, the stall starts to grow on the left side, and the stall starts to shrink on the left side, further rotating the aircraft into a high bank. And of course, the more you bank, the more the nose will tend to drop, okay? So reducing the angle of attack can unstall all of it. So after the rotation starts, if you pull the bar in, reduce the angle of attack, you've unstalled 100% of the wing, and now you have control to level off your wings. When you're in a turn, and especially when you're in a descending turn, so now we're getting into a little bit of spiral dive. If you can imagine, I'm gonna just really exaggerate that we're just about spinning around on this wing tip right now. And this outside wing is rotating like a radius around. We're moving through the air like this. We're falling out of the sky in a beautiful spiral dive or a beautiful spiral descent. If this wing, we're coming down, let's say at uh, 30 miles per hour, this wing tip on the outside is going 60, and this wing tip on the inside, if we had a pitot tube right here, would register 30, okay? So clearly, the outside wing is going much faster well, how does that affect our relative wind between the two wings? 
and you can calculate out your angle of attack there based on how fast you're going this way and how fast you're going this way. This wing that's going twice as fast, you still have the 30 miles per hour of relative wind this way, but now you have, um, what do we say, 60 miles per hour of relative wind this way, you have a much lower angle of attack here. So as the pilot pushes the bar out in a spiral descent, this wing, this low wing, is going to stall first. It's already at a higher angle of attack. And so when it stalls, you're gonna get roll, which is gonna further make the problem worse. The stall is gonna shrink on this side if it even stalled, or maybe it just all stalled on this side. And so when we talk about spiral recovery, which you've seen from some of the videos, uh, we're always talking about pulling the control bar back. We want to decrease that angle of attack. We want to get the entire wing flying again. And so not all spirals have a stall involved in them, but if you do stall and if you don't stall, um, pull the control bar in and then roll the wings level. So you're going to take your high hand and you're pulling your high hand to hip, and that is our recovery for spiral. We're also off the throttle. Uh, we have plenty of airspeed. If the aircraft is in this attitude, we've got all the airspeed we ever wanted. Gravity is doing that job for us. We do not want to overstress the aircraft as we come out of the bottom of the spiral dive. Now, it's important to understand how a flex wing turns to understand this next part, which is why if you were to just move the control bar sideways, okay? In other words, the pilot moves the control bar towards the earth to roll the aircraft out, how that could actually cause a stall. So the roll is probably the most complex part to really understand. And um, the way I, I uh, like to describe it is the first thing you have to understand is how billow shift can work. So first thing we need to look at and understand is that the keel, which is this tube right here, this keel moves from left to right. And so it gets closer to the right wing tip, it gets closer to the left wing tip. Let me demonstrate here. I'm going to grab the carriage and I'm going to activate the keel left and right by moving the carriage. And look at that. Now the keel's moving around in the keel pocket, so there's also play between the sail and the keel. But what's important to understand is that the keel is able to move left and right. It is in fact hinged at the nose plate. Now, too many of the books that explain this phenomenon, they're not explaining it wrong, they're explain, sl explaining it different. They talk about a floating cross tube. But, relatively speaking, if we say the cross tube stays in one spot and the leading edges stay in one spot, and the only thing that's going to shift is the keel is gonna shift from the back this way and this way, now I can wrap my head around how that's going to manipulate the fabric that's in a billowed effect on the trailing edge. So when I get closer this way, it's gonna tighten my fabric down tight on this side, and all that slack is gonna, I'm exaggerating here, it's gonna let all that fabric up on this side. And when that trailing edge comes up to here, we're gonna have a decrease in angle of attack. And when it comes down to here, kinda of like my model shows, like no twist at all, no billow, that's gonna give you a very high angle of attack here, and that's gonna allow the aircraft to roll. So here's the problem if it didn't do that. You're flying along, our relative wind is here on both wings, it's equal, and you start to turn. This wing is going to now be coming down, which is gonna create the relative wind from below, that's an increase in angle of attack. What does that do? Increases lift on the wing we're trying to get down. And this wing, as it comes up, that wing, the relative wind is now coming from the top as a result of its roll, and that's gonna decrease. So you have a decrease in lift on the wing that you're trying to make climb. You have an increase in lift on the wing you're trying to make descend. It doesn't work. That's why we have to have the wing billow. Now, the front of the wing doesn't billow. The front of the wing is hard. The back of the wing is soft and the back of the wing doesn't have a trailing edge spar. We have a piece of fabric that spans from here to here. And if we measure the distance from the center of the wing, our keel, we'll call that point B to point C, is also the same as from point A to point B. And therefore, 
our billow is equal. And so as we billow the trailing edge, that decreases the angle of incidence, that decreases the angle, angle of attack in flight as it billows. As it flattens out, it increases the angle of attack and creates, of course, more lift, all things being equal. And so we really need our wing to move out of the way in order for it to be able to roll and vice versa. So knowing that, if we're in a spiral dive, and we've already established that our low wing in the spiral is at a much higher angle of attack, and it doesn't even matter if it's a much higher. If it's one degree higher than this wing, guess which one's going to stall first? Which one's gonna reach critical angle of attack first as we push the control bar forward? A higher angle of attack. And as soon as it stalls and puts rotation in, now the angle attack is going to radically increase while the angle attack decreases here. You're going to get further away from stall on the wing that's high, that's climbing, and you're going to get further into your stall on the wing that's rolling, causing this horrible problem. So stall in a spiral can be very, very dangerous. Now, if the pilot moves the control bar sideways, they're going to take this nice billow that's, let's just say, given this wing 25 degrees angle of attack. And when that wing warps and takes that billow out to roll this direction, we have an increase in angle of attack from the billow shift. And that increase of angle of attack, decrease of angle of attack, could exceed the critical angle of attack on the low wing. If that should happen, the low wing will stall just from the pilot rolling out of the turn. So when you're in a nice big turn, the angle of attack is still higher on the low wing, but it's much closer. When you're spiraling and we have a vertical component where the aircraft is moving through the air, it's coming this way, the differential and angle of attack between the two wings is much, much higher. And that's why you're always gonna stall your inside wing if you stall. And just simply trying to roll out can be the activator of the stall from billow shifting the wing. So very important we use the high hand. It's still going to billow shift the wing, but we're going to reduce the angle of attack by much more than the increase of angle of attack from taking the billow out of the low wing. So something like a revolt behind me, you notice it doesn't have any vertical surface areas whatsoever. How does it fly straight? What is causing it to not start just flying this way or spinning out in the sky? Well, you've got two main uh, components. Now you look at the Revo and the first thing you're gonna say is, well, Larry, the Revo has these wheel spats in the back. Those must be there for a reason. It must need those. And it absolutely does on a Revo. So the first thing you have to determine is, is the carriage neutral, negative, or positive in yaw stability? And it's very, very simple to understand this. If you were to take the wing off, take the carriage, hang it by a rope, hang it by a string from a hoist, put it out in the wind. If the wind is coming this way and the carriage has negative yaw stability, it'll turn its butt to the wind. That's bad. You don't want the carriage fighting the wings. The wing is positively yaw stable, but if the carriage isn't working with the wing, you've got kind of a problem. And if it just doesn't know which way to kind of turn, you're neutral. And then if the wind blows and it turns into the wind, you have a positive yaw stable carriage. All right, so the carriage needs to be yaw stable. With these wheel spats on the Revo, it is yaw stable. Take the wheel spats off and it is yaw unstable, which means if you try flying a Revo with the wheel spats off, you're probably gonna be in for a really wild ride at best. The reason that you need to equalize this pressure is simply if you go from the hang point and you look at everything that's in front, vertical surface area, in front of a plumb line, and remember, swing through also adds more surface in front of the hang point. So if you're looking at it on the ground, you may only see this much. If you're looking at it hanging, you're gonna have all of this. And the more you have in front of your hang point, the less you have behind it. So this equalizes the equation of at least a 50-50 balance. So now the wing, the wing is now responsible. It's not having to fight the carriage because the carriage in itself is yaw stable. Does the carriage give you the stability to not skid 
Absolutely not. That stability needs to come from the wing. And this is pretty easy to understand. You have your relative wind again. We don't really care about the angle of attack in this example. But what we do want to talk about is if the aircraft starts to fly sideways, that's also called slip or uncoordinated flight. And there's many reasons you can get a trike into uncoordinated flight. But the moment it starts to get into uncoordinated flight, you have the resistance of the wind on this wing because of the delta wing shape, because of the sweep in the wing, now you have a completely exposed leading edge that's taken all this air pressure. And over here, the relative wind is almost skating by. So just by resistance, it's going to want to stabilize itself out and have that yaw stability. Now we touched on it a minute ago. We also have that negative angle of attack in the wingtips. So again, it's not accurate here in our model but these wingtips are flying at a negative angle attack and they're producing drag. And so because these wingtips, if you look from below, our wingtips are behind the hang point. Now it's very short coupled and the longer tail is, the more stability you get. So we're doing a lot of things. We're gonna to touch on pitch stability in a second, but our yaw stability is very short coupled. Anyway, this drag in our tips is going to also aid in stabilizing like a, a tail on a kite. We're adding drag to the aft part of the uh, uh, flying machine and therefore it's gonna help stabilize. So that delta wing shape plus your tip twist again is going to hopefully give you that yaw stability. There are of course other factors, but uh, those are the two basic ones. Most trike wings do not have positive or negative roll stability. They have neutral roll stability or very, very close to neutral roll stability, meaning if they start to veer off to the left, they'll probably continue to go left and may get worse. And most trikes, in fact, I think all trikes, are spirally stable, which means if you were to pass out at the controls while flying a trike, it would not continue to fly straight and level until it ran out of gas like a Cessna 152 would. The trike will inevitably slowly enter a turn, which will slowly enter into a spiral, and then it will actually stabilize in a beautiful spiral descent. And it'll actually be flying in coordinated flight, which is where the relative wind is not crossed, it's straight, straight. The aircraft thinks it's flying straight through the air, basically, and it's in a spiral and it's stabilized. So the trike is spirally stable. It does not have roll stability. However, it has gobs and gobs of pitch stability. And so you feel that pitch stability when you're flying a trike because when you pull back on the control bar, two things happen. One, you're going to feel that pressure. When you let go, it wants to go back to our neutral bar where it was trimmed to. It wants to fly at a constant angle of attack. And if you were to aim the nose down, the aircraft's gonna pick up speed, it's going to pitch up, and then of course it's gonna slow down and it's gonna make what's called a fugoid oscillation, but it's gonna make an oscillation and it's going to find that same trim speed before the upset. If you push the nose up, it'll drop. If you pull the nose down, it'll start a climb and ultimately it's going to stabilize again. If you change the power setting on the aircraft, the aircraft is going to nose down. It may get a little bit too much and it's gonna go through a little oscillation with the change in power setting, but then it's gonna stabilize. It's gonna stabilize at that same angle of attack that it was in level flight if the pilot is just leaving it trimmed for neutral. So that positive stability, we have uh, both positive static stability uh, and we also have dynamic stability. And so I wanna talk about the dynamic part of it because I think it's really, really interesting. So we have a few things that aid in the pitch stability of a wing. So a lot of times I get calls from all over, usually outside the country, uh, places that aren't as blessed as we are in the uh, in, uh, U.S. and other places where we can go out and buy these expensive toys. They want to make their own wings. And I have to stop them and tell them, find a used hang glider wing, and you make your carriage yourself, maybe find some plans, don't attempt to make the wing. Because the wing really is very complex in the way it works. Um, so the three things, three main things, and there are still more things I can go all day long about pitch stability and what causes it. But the first thing we already talked about is the twist in the wing. That twist in the wing is very important. It plays a very important role in pitch stability. 
So let's just talk about twist by itself. We talked about the wingtips are creating a downforce. The wingtips are behind the hang point. So the faster the aircraft goes, the more downforce you can expect to get on the wingtips, which will tend to pitch the nose up. The center of the wing, which is making most of the lift, if you know some basics of aerodynamics, about a third of the way back from the cord of the wing, about a third of the way, and it depends on the airfoil, is where your center of lift is. So if we look at the center of the wing, and you go a third of the way back, the center of the wing is making a tremendous amount of lift in front of the hang point. So back to the twist, as you go faster and you get more downforce at the tips, the tips tend to want to drop. But likewise, we have our highest camber, we have the thickest part of the uh, wing airfoil is in the center. Well, now getting back to Bernoulli effect, the faster you move an asymmetrical airfoil. So what do we have? We have a generally a flat bottom wing, roughly, and we have a very high camber wing. The faster you move that through the air, even with no angle of attack on an airfoil shaped like this, even with no angle of attack, Bernoulli effect, you're going to get additional lift. So when you get additional lift in the center of the wing, it's lifting in front of the hang point and the wing tips are pushing down behind the hang point. So how does that all translate into pitch stability? Well, you're flying along straight and level and for whatever reason, the nose drops. Because we have gravity, the aircraft is gonna accelerate. As it accelerates, now you've just activated the root section of the wing to generate more lift in front of the hang block and you've, generated, you've activated the wing tips to start generating more downforce behind the hang point and that's going to pitch the aircraft up. We're pitched up, what happens to our airspeed? It starts to decrease. As it decreases, the downforce relieves, the lift relieves, and it goes the other way. And so it'll make, hopefully, if the wing's designed correctly, it'll make smaller oscillations until it stabilizes. So a big, big part of the pitch stability is our twist in the wing. And what creates the twist in the wing? Well, when we're in 1G flight, because the fabric is basically what's holding us up. The lift is creating the billow and the twist. So when we're flying along, we're sitting in our seat, the fabric is inflated, so to speak, and our wing is in the shape that gives us the pitch stability. However, if we're not in 1G flight, we are next to a thunderstorm, we hit a, a, a downdraft, our wing, would normally flip inside out. The wing's no longer in a pitch stable shape at that point, and the aircraft would basically tuck and do all kinds of bad things. And while you're weightless, we're weight shift, you're not gonna have weight shift to be able to control the aircraft. So, on a king posted wing, there's something called a king post with the luff lines or the reflex bridle, which mainly holds a lot of reflex in the wing, but it also holds that twist and that billow. On our topless wing design, we have a sprog and we have a dive stick or some of our double surface wings, we have two sprogs. But in either case, what those guys are doing, those arms that are coming off here, is they're artificially holding a billow and a twist into the wing. So if you can imagine, the higher camber you have compared to the less camber you have in the wing tips, the more pitch stability you're going to have. So if we were to take all the battens out of this wing and we flatten out these root battens in this section here, we're going to lose Bernoulli effect as we increase airspeed. And there's all kinds of reasons for not using a high camber wing. They're terrible for going fast. So, but in our case, if we reduce, we have a pitch stable wing, but we come over there and say, you know, I don't want that high camber in the center of my wing and uh, I want much more camber in my wingtip. So if you look at a batten, we take out a batten from our wingtip, it has a very, very small curve in it. And if you take out a batten from our root area, it has a very, very large, large camber curve to that, that batten or that uh, rib. Increase the camber here, decrease the camber here. The aircraft drops its nose, it starts to accelerate. 
the additional camber here starts to make lift in the tips. The lack of camber in the nose does not start to make lift in the root. And you have what's called a divergent wing. And the faster it goes, the more it wants to dive. The faster it dives, the faster it goes, the more it wants to dive. And the pilot could generally, in most cases, push the bar forward, but we've lost that dynamic pitch stability. So the progression of the airfoil from root to tip, if we have a very thin tip and a very high camber, all things being equal, you're gonna have more pitch stability. If you have a very high camber in the tip and a very low camber in the root, you're gonna have less pitch stability. Now it all works together, but if you look at the airfoil on something like a modern day airplane or any airplanes, even from like uh, the, you know, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, uh, the camber is very smooth and the top of a wing, generally speaking, has a nice arc. It's a very teardrop shape and it's very, very efficient. It's much more efficient than the airfoils that we use in our trikes. If you look at the airfoil in our trike, it has a very blunt nose, is a very high camber, very far forward, and has a very long tail. So all that camber is happening in the front. And that is what we call a stable airfoil family. Well, on a typical airplane that has a tail, the tail is causing the, uh, giving the pitch stability to the aircraft. So we can rely on the tail to basically do everything we need uh, with the dynamic pitch stability and everything. So basically, these wingtips here, are the tail, but they're back here. So they've got this long moment arm. They have a lot of control over the pitch on that airplane, no problem. We're very short coupled though, so we may need help from some of these other factors for our pitch stability. So on an airplane wing, and I'll grab my, uh, my wing. An airplane wing, when you increase angle of attack, and this is on the test, the center of lift migrates forward on an airplane wing. And that's a result of the airfoil that they're using. And when you decrease angle attack, the, uh, the center pressure or the lift moves back. Well, that's a destabilizing effect on the wing. So on a trike, we can't have that. We can't use some of these better, more efficient airfoils on the trike. We need the center lift to either stay in one spot as it goes through its angle of attack range, or we actually need it to move the center of lift back or forward as the angle attacks. And now the center of lift is actually going to aid us in pitch stability by moving back at high angles of attack and forward with low angles of attack. And so that's the last part of our pitch stability and that's called reflex. And so reflex, you have your camber and then the back of the wing actually comes up and reflexes and that reflex causes the center lift to move back at a high angle of attack and forward at a low angle of attack. And so that gives us pitch stability. So, and there's a lot of other little tricks and whatnot, but those are the basics of uh, the wing having pitch stability. So we talked about yaw stability, and some trikes have more yaw stability than others. Okay, the bigger the wing, the sharper the nose angle, you're gonna have more yaw stability. The less pod area you have, the more yaw stable the carriage is, the more yaw stability you're gonna have. If you have winglets on your wings, a lot of people think, oh yeah, they do that for efficiency. The winglets are primarily, in almost all cases I'm aware of, used for yaw stability on the wing. And so typically, uh, wings with lower twist um, uh, lose that drag at the wingtips. That's a good area where the, uh, the vertical stabilizers uh, go right here on the wingtips. But in any case, when you start to make a turn, the first thing that's gonna happen with the trike when it starts to make a turn is you can expect possible adverse yaw. Now, why would you get adverse yaw? Same reason you get it in a Cessna. And again, uh, you can look this up, a little bit more information about why the nose goes out of the turn when you turn anything with ailerons. Well, we're kind of the same way. With our billow shift, when this wing comes up and increases its angle of attack, that increases our induced drag. The lift has a penalty of drag and that pulls the wing back. Now, you, if you have a wing that uh, rolls very slow or it's a blade style wing with very little billow shift, you're gonna have less adverse yaw. 
if you have a wing with lots of billow shift, like I like to fly, it's gonna give you lots of roll rate, but it's also gonna pull your nose out of the turn. So we have advantages and disadvantages to that. Uh, Self-coordinating wings, meaning you roll them and they immediately coordinate themselves. They have more yaw stability built into the entire trike and wing combination. The downside is those are generally take more work to get them into a steeper bank. When you make a turn and you get a little bit of adverse yaw, the adverse yaw now, because our relative wind that was here, now is pushing on this leading edge. Okay? And when we have more pressure on this leading edge, less pressure on this leading edge, it's going to squeeze and push this leading edge towards the keel and it's going to crown that billow right up. It's going to reduce the angle of attack and it's going to cause a pro roll wanting to roll into the turn because of that slip. Now, there's two ways to handle that. One is to high side the wing, which is to try to roll out. Well, if you've ever tried to roll out of a slipping turn while it's slipping in, you're having to fight all that force. You need to now billow the wing back level, but you don't have equal forces on your leading edges. And it can make the wing go into lockout with some designs, or it can certainly at least make the controls much heavier. So when you push the control bar forward, what it's gonna do is it's going to coordinate the turn, which literally, here's our relative wind, when you push forward, it's gonna swing the nose into the relative wind, and now the relative wind is gonna be tracking straight across, meaning you're gonna have now equal pressure on both leading edges at the point that you've coordinated properly. But that also means that you should be able to take your hands off the controls and the aircraft should continue in that bank. And again, depending on all things being equal, at a certain point, if you're past 35, 45 degrees, most trikes will want to still start to roll in to the turn. And once that spiral starts, the angle of attack um, is going to be higher in your right wing. Be very, very careful about stalling the uh, aircraft on the uh, recovery from that spiral. So let's talk more about spirals and uh, what the problem with trikes is because this is a real problem. And uh, first of all, spirals shouldn't be anything that's scary. Spirals shouldn't be anything that's dangerous. And if the pilot understands that they're A, in a spiral dive and understands spiral recovery, it's just like entering or exiting any other maneuver. And so long as the wing is not stalled, and honestly, even if it is stalled, the recovery is almost instantaneous. But the reason that trikes are more prone to spiral dives is has all to do with some real basics. Trikes are inherently low energy machines. And so let's talk about energy for just two seconds. Energy is the ability to create G-force. Uh, to create a deflection, to create an action. If you're flying along in your trike, the odds are if you slam the bar all the way forward and you have a G meter, you're gonna get a very low number, like less than one and a half Gs. You can't make two Gs at cruise speed with most trikes. There are some I could name that, uh, that definitely they're gonna have a blade wing, they're gonna be going faster, and they can create more G-force for sure. Slower trikes in general, uh, higher wing loading trikes, so the big trikes with the little wings, they do a worse job of creating G-force and therefore in order to create G-force we have to energize the wing. How do we do that? By reducing angle of attack and going faster. And now we have energy. So if we're cruising along at 60 miles per hour and I slam the control bar forward, I might get 1.4 G's. If I pull the bar in, and now we get up to 80 miles per hour and I slam the bar forward, I might get 2.2 Gs. So big difference in the amount of energy. Most basic aircraft, whether they're talking a Cirrus or a Piper Cub, if you're flying along at almost any speed there is, unless you're really particularly practicing a slow flight, but any of the cruise speeds, fast cruise speed, slow cruise speed, you pull back on the sticker and the yoke in an airplane, you can create over two Gs, no problem. In the trike, you can't. So the lack of having energy at all times, unless the pilots put the energy in the wing by pulling back on the controls to energize the wing, is the problem. So you see it when we land. Uh, if you fly trikes, you know that you 
pull the controls in, you increase your airspeed so that we can have energy to round out and to flare. The Cessna, they can come in at their best glide ratio and they can just start pulling back and they'll, they'll flare for maybe 10 seconds. The trike, if you come in at your best glide ratio, you'll push the bar once, it'll nose up and boom! You're not gonna have maybe even the energy to arrest the descent. We're low energy. So back to the other aircraft. If the trike is making a 60 degree bank turn, and this is a good rule of thumb to know, you need two Gs. And it doesn't matter if you're in an F-16 making a coordinated turn in level flight, you're at two Gs. If they pull three Gs, they're climbing. If they pull one G, they're falling, same as us. So the steeper you bank, the more G-force you need to be able to make at that moment in order to hold the aircraft up. And that's because when we're in one G flight, all of our lift is going down. So we're making a thousand pounds of lift and we weigh a thousand pounds, the aircraft can hold itself up. And so if you look, if this pen is a measurement, when we go 60 degrees, it takes one, two pens to get back down to the table. It is a very geometric formula that you can calculate out with a protractor and a little bit of math of how much g-force you need. 45 degree bank angle is about, I think it's 1.4, we can check my math, I, uh, I believe it's somewhere in there, but it's exponential. So you need very little g-force, more g-force, quite a bit more g-force. By the time you go 90 degrees, well, the answer is infinity. You need an infinite amount and no amount is enough because we have no vertical component of lift left. So what that means is to make a turn, if we go 60 degrees in bank, we need to make two Gs. If you can effortlessly um, just push your bar forward and make two Gs with, with your trike, you're gonna hold your trike up in the air. If you're too slow in the most amount, remember when we're in level flight, we push the bar all the way forward, we could get to 1.3 Gs before we stalled, and the next thing is it stalls. And we bank to something that requires more than 1.3 Gs, like a 45 degree bank turn. We're gonna do one of two things. We're either gonna pull 1.29 Gs, and that's not gonna be enough to hold us up because we, need, we needed 1,400 pounds, not 1,290 pounds of lift. Or we're gonna stall the thing, and then we're gonna really fall out of the sky, and guess which wing's probably gonna drop first, and that's gonna onset uh, a nasty spiral. Having enough energy, having enough airspeed, before you pick the bank angle that you're gonna enter with your trike is very important. And so if you have a great big wing and a very light carriage, you may be able to pull two Gs. Therefore, you know you can go to 60 degree bank turn without energizing your wing, just barely. So maybe you do a 45 or 50 degree bank turn, no problem. But if you're flying a trike that can only make 1.3 Gs, you absolutely, you go to a 60 degree bank turn, I'll tell you one thing, you're not holding the aircraft up with the wing. You need 2,000 pounds of lift, you have a maximum of 1,300 pounds of lift at, at your disposal, and then it stalls if you try to get more, you're coming down, and when you're coming down in a bank, that is a spiral. And then we just execute spiral recovery. Again, that's high hand to hip, and that's going to reduce angle of attack. No throttle needed. Once the aircraft comes out of the spiral, we bleed the speed off, and then we can step into the gas and we're gonna resume throttle then. We don't need to add throttle when we're aiming at the ground. Not a good idea. Another big one, and uh, we just uh, had a, a situation like this. The trike is flying along. The pilot brings the nose up. You enter the turn nose up. You know the rest of this story? When you enter the turn nose up, the aircraft will do a beautiful turn, kind of a wing over effect, and it will exit the turn nose down. If you enter level, increase your g-force you'll leave level if you enter a turn low a lot of times you'll come out nose high because you're picking up speed and it wants to come out when you enter a turn high you're going to enter the turn low and then if you use the two biggest mistakes in spiral recovery one is to go to full throttle that full throttle will cause the aircraft to climb but guess which way up is to this aircraft that way. So it's doing what the pilot's asking, 
when they give it full throttle in a spiral, and of course I'm exaggerating here, but up is this way, pushing the bar forward to want to climb. Now climb is always in every other attitude, up is up. But when you're spiral dive, up is that way into the ground. So pushing forward will take you up into the ground, adding throttle will take you up into the ground. And in both cases, we're in a very, very high, abnormally high angle of attack on this wing because of the spiral effect. And guess which wing's gonna stall first? That inside wing, and it's just gonna make everything completely worse. So here, the pilot would take his high hand and pull towards his hip. High hand to hip, done. And the recovery should be very, very quick. We're talking one, maybe two seconds, depending on how fast the aircraft can roll, how hard the pilot pulls, but it's not a three or four second recovery in most cases. Now, what some manufacturers will do is they will limit the angle of attack that the pilot can get with the front strut called a stall limiter. And so all we need to do is geometrically shorten the front cables, move the control bar forward, and now we've limited the achievable angle of attack in straight and level flight. We've limited the angle of attack. However, if we were to pitch up, take our foot off the gas, so here's our relative wind, we're flying along. We gotta get some energy, right? We gotta get some energy to do this maneuver. So we speed up and now we release that energy. We pitch up real nice. Now we're running out of energy and we push the bar off the stall and it stalls. The moment that it stalls, the relative wind is here instantaneously. But this is not instantaneous, which means that that angle of attack, we hit critical here, as soon as it stalls, that angle of attack can go like 90 degrees to the wing. And now you've introduced a tremendous, tremendous angle of attack. And the wing starts this rotation, starts this rotation. And if it rotates through the relative wind to here, it is possible for the wing to start an outside loop. And once that outside loop starts, <clears throat> the carriage falls backwards and then it whips again and the g-force in this is said to be like over uh, 10 g's. You'll black out after the first uh, rotation or second rotation. Usually the wing is gonna break, and if you're lucky enough, you get to find out what color your parachute is that day. Anytime you have a nose up followed by a rapid pitch down, uh -huh. the relative wind is gonna switch much quicker, because the moment you stop going up is the moment that relative wind is no longer from here. And so the moment that it runs out of that vertical and starts going this way, that relative wind is here. And that relative wind switching, even though you didn't move, that stalls the wing. And you get a big stall. Remember, it's the twist that causes the stall to onset slowly. This exceeded critical angle attack. This didn't exceed critical angle attack, you know, both sides. When you get that radical increase in, pitch, uh, in angle of attack, now you just exceeded all of the angle of attack all the way out in your wing. You're going to get a massive pitch down. And like I said, if that rotation exceeds your pitch stability of your aircraft, and that's called a tumble. Now, tumbles, you would think, wow, that sounds dangerous. Maybe I shouldn't even get into triking. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> is there any way to get out of a tumble? No. Um, but there is a way not to get into a tumble. Tumbles are almost, you can go back 20 years, there are so few tumbles and trikes. And the tumbles and trikes typically were people doing aerobatics, where they exceeded their 30 degrees nose up. And I'm not saying you can't exceed 30 degrees nose up and take the aircraft out of its placard limitations, but once you're past 30 degrees nose up, you can do the wrong thing. You can step off the gas abruptly. You can push the bar out. You can do wrong things and cause the aircraft to go into an unrecoverable tumble. If you fly within your 30 degrees nose up, 30 degrees nose down, 60 degrees in bank, you cannot do something wrong with the controls or throttle that'll cause loss of control that's unrecoverable. So, so long as you fly in your box, which is a pretty good box, there's no risk of the tumble. But you can fly completely in your box and all of a sudden you see a bird or another aircraft and you bank radically, but you don't have the airspeed to be able to create the G-force to make this turn. And now you bank, 
and you don't push forward, the aircraft goes this way. You bank, you push forward, still goes this way. Push forward more, you stall the inside wing. All three bad scenarios. So very, very easy to inadvertently uh, go into a spiral.